Today we begin a new series called It Is Written. We're embarking into the actual narrative part of Matthew now. We're done with the genealogy. Put that away. Uh, now I get it. It might feel a little bit weird to talk about this story when it's not December, uh, when we're not in Christmas time. Uh, though it's entirely possible that the story didn't actually take place in December to begin with, but I guess that's neither here nor there. Now, we're going to take a little bit of a different look at it than maybe you've taken before. See, Matthew does something interesting here. There's five major events in Jesus' early life that Matthew wraps around these five different prophecies uh, that have happened in the Old Testament. And so, there's a reason for that. We see it here, and we're going to see it again, spoilers for the end of our Matthew you know, series, uh, when we get closer to Jesus' death. Matthew starts peppering in the Old Testament nice and heavy because he's trying to do something. He's trying to show that this is no accident. Though things might seem a little strange, they might seem a little bit weird, this is exactly how God has intended this to go. This is all by design. And so this is important because we're going to see things that maybe that seems a little bit weird to us. Matthew's saying, hey, this is all a part of the plan. And so this five-week series that we start today, we're going to look each week at one of those passages, sort of unpack what's happening, what Matthew's referencing, and so on. Hence the title, it is written. Now, when you first get married, especially if you do so a little bit later in life, you have to reconcile your different ways of doing things. And maybe you do one, things one way, your wife does things another way, and so you've got to find some common ground there. For instance, does the toilet paper go over or under the roll, right? Now, thankfully, this was not a point of contention for Adrian and I. We are both over people, as God intended. Uh, <laughs> neither of us married some kind of monster or something that goes under. Uh, we did have to come to an understanding on shoes, though, specifically shoes in the house, uh, off or on. Personally, I'm an off guy. Uh, I'm not, I don't harp on people about that, so if you come to my house, don't worry, you don't have to take your shoes off, it's fine. Uh, but day to day, I go shoeless. And this really only works if you get buy-in from everyone else in the house. Otherwise, you're walking across the carpet in your socks and you step in a wet spot from someone else's shoes. It's just terrible, right? Uh, the problem, though, in our first house was that the floors were, like, nearly impossible to get clean. Like, no matter what you did, they wouldn't get completely clean. It's a really old house in D.C., these really old wood floors. And so if you just walked around with just socks on, by the end of the day, your socks would be a little bit dark gray on the bottom and stuff. And so we had to compromise. I bought some slippers, right? And so you've got to put those things together. Maybe you have different ideas about what dinner looks like or whatever that may be. Uh, it can be disorienting when you have a way of doing something and someone else has a different way of doing it, and you've got to bring those two things together, whether that's at home, whether that's at work, wherever. When things don't go the way that we maybe expect them to, that can kind of throw us off. It can ruffle our feathers a little bit. I was in Green Bay recently and went to Chipotle as I always do when I'm in Greece, because I used to live four blocks from a Chipotle, and now I live 40 miles from a Chipotle, so I get, like, you know, I get the itch every now and then. I go through withdrawals. And so what cracks me up, though, is Chipotle first-timers. And the, this time I was there alone, there, it was just a line of people who had never been to Chipotle before. Now, if you're not aware of what this is, it's this fast-food Mexican restaurant. Uh, but they do things a little bit different. It's not like a Taco Bell or something where you walk up and say, give me nachos, and they give you nachos, and that's the end of the transaction. It's sort of this assembly line procedure where you walk up and you've got to choose between a burrito or a burrito bowl, or maybe you're some kind of weirdo, you get tacos, I don't know. But so you pick that, and then you've got to pick your rice, you've got to pick your beans, you pick your meat, and then you pick your toppings, and you make your way down the line, and you pay. And so it always cracks me up when people come for the first time because they just get this deer in the headlights look like, wait, what am I supposed to do? Like, hold on, what is the, what question did you just, what kind of meat? Well, I don't know what to do with this question. You know, it's like people just get like, and so it was funny because I'm standing there and I, you know, I can maybe be a little impatient at times. And so I'm standing there and there's like one person that's just taking forever. And then there's a person standing behind her that's like standing away from the counter and is just kind of like, hmm. It's lit there are literally like 14 words on the whole Chipotle menu. It's like burrito, 
bowl. Talk, that's it. Like, this is steak, beet, whatever. And so she's just like, hmm, oh, you can go ahead of me. I don't know what I want. It's like, it's Chipotle. There's really only one thing. Whatever. See, what happens is as we go through life, we start to recognize patterns. We have expectations of the way things are supposed to go. And so you go to a place like Chipotle for the first time. And if you've never been there at a Moe's or Qdoba or any of the other places that are exactly the same, you have an idea in your head of what a fast food restaurant is like. You walk up, you say words, or you just say a number. Like, you don't even have to say words anymore. It's two, and then they give you food. And so, and so you have that expectation, but then you go to a Chipotle or whatever, and that expectation gets broken. You don't know what to do with it. See, sometimes God has a way of shattering our expectations. Matthew writes about that in chapter 1, verse 18. He says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So to start, we get the genesis of Jesus Christ. That's the word Matthew uses that for us shows up as birth. We get the genesis of of Jesus Christ. Again, we're looking forward to this new creation that God is doing in the midst of the old. We also meet Mary and Joseph, the parents of Jesus. Now, they're an engaged couple, which is a little bit different in their culture than it is in ours. See, to them, engagement was binding. So if you're engaged and you break up that betrothal, what you have just done is a divorce. There is no difference in that culture. It's the same thing. Unlike today, where if now you're in premarital counseling and some kind of crazy comes out, run for the hills, right? <laughs> Get away from that as fast as you possibly can, right? And you're good. There's no penalty for doing so. I actually had a professor in college who took pride in the amount of couples that he convinced to break up. And he kind of figured, well, if I can do it, then they probably shouldn't have been together in the first place, right? And so Mary and Joseph, they're engaged and they're not married which means they haven't yet consummated their marriage. But Mary's pregnant. This is problematic. We're told right away, though, that the child is from the Holy Spirit. Which is interesting. It's just as in the original creation, right? Holy Spirit's hovering over the surface of the deep. Here, he shows up, working, moving, acting in the middle of this new creation that's happening. And note, too, that it's the Holy Spirit that brings Jesus into Mary's life. This is the same way it works with us, too. It's the Holy Spirit that brings Jesus into our lives. When Jesus comes into anyone's life, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not human initiative. It's not man's effort. It's the Holy Spirit. And so in some respects, every conversion is a virgin birth. It's peculiar, though, that God would choose an engaged couple for this. Why would he do that? I mean, it's the most important mission possible, and he picks these two people that are greatly inconvenienced by it, to say the least, right? And so Joseph gets in his mind he's going to divorce Mary, which is understandable. Guys, you're engaged to someone. They come to you and say they're pregnant, and you know for a fact it cannot possibly be yours. That's going to be a problem, right? If that's me, I'm like, deuces, hit the road. <laughs> like, we're done here, right? <laughs> and so that's Joseph's plan, but Joseph says, it says that he's going to do it quietly. Now, that quietly is not for his sake, it's for Mary's sake. See, if it was found out that Mary was pregnant and it wasn't his, that would be adultery. Even though they're engaged, it's still, remember, it's the same thing, and so that would be adultery. And adultery, in Levitical law, is punishable by death. And so, this is not some small thing that Joseph has to deal with. This is big and important. And so, what he's willing to do is he's willing to accept the social shame of this divorce in order to protect Mary. It is an incredibly selfless thing that he's doing here. 
He's going above and beyond. He's a stand-up guy. As far as he knows, his wife-to-be has cheated on him, and he's still making sure that he takes care of her. Now, that's not going to cut it, though. See, when Jesus comes into the picture, he causes us to reevaluate our values. And so what seemed like the righteous thing to do for Joseph, all of a sudden now it falls short. Jesus demands more. Because of Jesus, we've got to reshift, we've got to rethink our values. And so Joseph is actually going to be asked to accept this whole situation. Now, no one saw this part of the plan coming. The Jews were not looking forward to the virgin birth of their Messiah. It wasn't on their radar. It wasn't something they had thought of. And you wouldn't think that God's going to call, you know, that God's going to form the Messiah, deliver him in these humiliating circumstances. You wouldn't, that seems weird. Honestly, like if I'm writing the plan to save the world, it probably doesn't look like this, right? But God has different priorities than we do. And so what seems foolish to us or weird or weak to him seems like strength. It seems like wisdom. It might be the plan all along. After all, nothing is more humiliating than the cross. That God would, dis- would condescend and become a human being, that's bad enough. But then you're telling me he's going to be mistreated by his creation. It's preposterous. And then he's going to willingly be executed like a common criminal. It's absurd. Paul writes about it like this in 1 Corinthians. He says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. And so what God asks Mary and Joseph to do is incredibly hard. It's incredibly embarrassing. But he's not asking them to do anything he wouldn't do himself. It's certainly not the point of the passage, but there's a leadership lesson in that. Also, in this passage, I think you can make a pretty solid argument for when life begins. You have Jesus considered alive and human at conception here. I don't think that's a small thing. This has huge ramifications. Again, it's just that God's priorities are maybe not always in line with ours. I think part of this is that the unborn are an underpowered people group that the gospel calls us to speak up for. So Matthew goes on in verse 21. He says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so Joseph's told what to name this kid. He's going to name him Jesus. Now that's the Greek form of Joshua, or in Hebrew, Yeshua. It's this name that means God saves. Hence, you'll call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now, some people put a lot of thought into their kids' names. They pick names that are rich with meaning for them and try to use those. Honestly, we're probably going to end up just picking something that sounds cool. That's probably the way Adrian and I are going to end up going. But whether you're into name meanings or not, this name has a lot to say. It explains who Jesus is and what Jesus does. See, he is God, and he saves. It's a name that points us in two directions. It says that he is human. It means that he is divine. We get that double nature of Christ right there. And it tells what he's going to do. He's going to save his people. Well, who are his people? I think that's a fair question. He's going to save his people. Okay, who are the people? John actually answers this for us in John chapter 1. He says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So his people is everyone who believes in him. Jew or Gentile, it's the people who are in Christ, that's his people that he's come to save. Now see, the Jews had uh, been expecting this Messiah, and he shows up here, he's going to save his people, so we know who he's saving. But what is he saving them from? Well, it says that he's saving them from their sins. The interesting word there is the there. Saving them from their sins. See, the Jews had been expecting this Messiah, but they were expecting to be saved from the sins of others. There's a people group that you go back to Egypt, been just oppressed and captive there 
from then on, you have oppressor after oppressor shows up in the Old Testament that just makes life brutal for these people over and over. Now it's sort of culminated in Rome is the big oppressor that's on the scene. And so their expectation is the Messiah is going to come and he's going to change this pattern. We're not going to be the victims anymore. We're going to be the conquerors. He's going to deliver us from the sins of our oppressors. See, most movements need a bad guy to thrive. That's how you really get people invested. You got to have something that you can rally everybody to fight against. I mean, just we're in, you know, an uh, election season. Listen to the way political candidates talk. You listen close enough, you start to see patterns. That everyone has a boogeyman that needs to be eliminated. It's like, we'll vote for me and we'll stop this group of people that's trying to get more power and ruin our country. And so it doesn't matter which side, whoever, everyone's got someone that they're out there to stop from ruining everything. Why? Because that's how you get people invested on your side. They need something to fight. That's why most major network news is fear-based, because you've got to create that villain to get everyone riled up about. They're mobilizing against the enemy. You give people someone to hate, you give people someone to fear, it's a whole lot easier to drum up support for the cause. But Jesus does something completely unexpected. He focuses on an unlikely villain. Us. Jesus says, before we worry about saving you from everybody else's sin, we got to talk about your sin first. What you really need to be saved from is you. No wonder the gospel's unpopular. The starting place has to be acknowledging that you are the bad guy who needs conquering. Matthew goes on. It says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. All this takes place to fulfill. See, Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy, literally the stuffing in, filling it with meaning. And so Matthew's going to show us here, none of this happens by accident. This is all part of the plan. God didn't get mistaken, and he chose this couple, and things went awry. No, this is the way he intended it. And so now we see the same Holy Spirit that inspired Isaiah to speak these words to begin with inspires the events that are going to bring them to their climax. All of the Old Testament is a story that points to Jesus. And what we see in Jesus is a plan that you can really only see in hindsight through the Old Testament. It really only makes sense. Once you get that Jesus key, it sort of unlocks what's gone before it. It's kind of like watching the movie The Sixth Sense for a second time. Right? If you've seen this movie or not, spoilers ahead for a 17-year-old movie. You've had enough time. I don't feel bad. The first time through the movie, everything makes sense. You got this little kid, he sees dead people, follows Bruce Willis around, they hang out. Sure, it's great. But at the end, you get the big twist. Bruce Willis was dead the whole time. <laughs> right? It's like one of the best twists in movie history. What? Bruce Willis was dead the whole time, that's crazy. I mean, it's such a great twist, it probably ruined M. Night Shyamalan's career because he spent the whole rest of his career trying to recreate this and, in my opinion, failed catastrophically. And so it works so well because you watch the movie a second time and it all makes sense but in a different way. You start watching, you start picking up on things like, oh, snap, Bruce Willis doesn't actually talk to anybody else the entire movie. He only talks to the kid. That's crazy. I could have sworn he had the conversation with the therapist lady, but no, it's just the kid. Like, huh. You start watching, like, the color red, man. It shows up everywhere in all these important scenes. It's like orange in The Godfather. It's, like, it's everywhere when something big goes down. You're like, huh, how about that? You start noticing all these stuff. And so the movie made sense the first time, but now the second time, now that you know how it ends, everything that's gone before, now it's packed with more meaning. It means something different. We see it differently because we know how it ends. The Old Testament's kind of similar. And because we know about Jesus, we can look back 
and read him into all of these situations where we would have completely missed him before. And so what Matthew sees is these patterns, these crucial events in salvation history that happen. He goes, ow, oh, this happened back then. Well, it's kind of like what Jesus does over here. And so these patterns, now they have deeper meanings in Jesus. The easiest picture of this actually comes from John's Gospel, and it's something that Jesus himself says in chapter 3. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now what he's talking about is it's the story in Numbers, where Israelites are complaining, they're grumbling, they're cursing God, they're mad at Moses, and so God sends poisonous snakes into the camp. Snakes bite a bunch of people. Few people die. And it's pretty bad. And so Moses goes to God and goes, well, how do we, what do we do here? So God tells him, okay, here's what you do. You make this bronze snake, you put it on a pole, you raise it up, and then if anybody looks at the snake, they'll be healed. So Moses does this and it works. And so Jesus points out a similarity. He's like, hey, so remember that story where something gets raised up on a pole and everyone who is dying looks to it and they have life. Funny story, because soon I'm going to be raised up on a pole, and everyone who is dying when they look to me will have life. And so that doesn't mean that that serpent didn't have meaning to the Israelites then. Of course it did. It saved their lives. They looked to it. They were healed. To them, that immediate context, that was filled completely. But Jesus comes and goes, well, there's even more meaning stuffed into that that you didn't know about. See, I'm going to do the same thing in the same way. So the text had meaning, but now it's filled with meaning. It's crammed, it's packed full. And so what was the original meaning of this Emmanuel prophecy? See, Isaiah prophesies that there's going to be a child who's going to be born, and that child is going to be the sign that God is with Israel and that he is going to give them victory. It happens in chapter 7 of Isaiah. It's referenced again in chapter 8, and then it sort of gets trailed into chapter 9. And it had meaning to the people in Isaiah's time. Most people think now it was probably Isaiah's son, Mehershal Ahashbaz. That's a mouthful. That he was probably the child that Isaiah is prophesying about. And if you keep, the way it keeps going through the book of Isaiah helps us see that Isaiah probably thought there was more to this, too. That in the immediate surrounding time, yes, the birth of that child fulfilled this. But it trails into chapter 9. And what do we get in chapter 9? We get the poem that you know, we're familiar with from Christmas time. For to us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And that is very clearly not about anyone living back then. It's about this Messiah character. And so it seems like Isaiah even knows, okay, this is about this, but it's also about something beyond it. And what Matthew does for us then is Matthew connects those dots and puts them together. So if this is the case, are there two virgin births then? Jesus' and Mehershal Hashbaz. Well, the answer to that question is probably not. See, the word rendered virgin there in the Hebrew can have a couple different meanings. One is virgin, the way we think of virgin. The other is any marriageable aged woman. And so it means both of those things. It could mean them simultaneously. It could mean them separately. And so it appears that in Isaiah's time, Isaiah's not talking about a literal virgin in the way that we would think of. But Matthew's reading this, and he sees this prophecy, and he goes, oh, not only... Does Jesus bring this to fulfillment? But he even changes, virgin becomes very literal now. It's not this reference to just any woman now, literally. It's a virgin. And so, again, remember, the Jews aren't expecting a virgin-born Messiah, but here we have it. It happens. And the fact that it goes down, it shows God's action in this situation, how he doesn't need human interaction. He does what he will. And now this event gets contested because people find it hard to believe. One, people say, well, there's very little historical evidence. But 
I mean, honestly, like, unless you travel back in time and just follow Mary around during that time period, I'm not really sure what historical evidence you're looking for there. I don't know how there could possibly be anything. But what is interesting is that both Matthew and Luke mention it. Matthew and Luke paint very different pictures of Jesus' birth. It's not that they're completely two different stories. They choose what they want to highlight, what they don't want to highlight, what they think is important, and what fits the message they're trying to get across. And so Matthew's going to focus on these things that fulfill these prophecies. Luke's going to focus on something else. He tells it a little more from Mary's side. One thing they both agree on, one thing they both include in their stories, is the virgin birth, which to me gives it credence. This, in fact, happen. This speaks very strongly to it being historical. I think, too, is that there's a lot of chronological snobbery around this. The skeptics say, well, everybody was dumb back then. They thought everything was magic, so of course they believed it happened. But that's just not true. It was just as unbelievable to them as it would be to us today. I mean, the Bible records people that see Jesus resurrected from the dead. This happens at the end of Matthew. So spoilers for later down the road. The end of Matthew, people see Jesus risen from the dead and doubt the resurrection. They're looking at him. And they go, eh, I don't know about that. It says that his disciples came, they saw him, many believed, but some doubted. I think we way underestimate the skepticism of them. There's a saying that's sort of taken as a guideline as you're going through a text like scripture or something ancient, is that the ancients were wise too. We've got to give them credit because they were just as skeptical as we would be. Now, this child is given a second name. First he's given the name Jesus, and now he's given the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Matthew spells that out to make sure that the readers get it. Jesus, he kind of lets it go, lets you infer implicitly what that name means. Emmanuel, he spells it out. Emmanuel means God with us wants to make sure we get it. See, the whole story of the Bible is the restoration of God's presence with his people. That we start in the garden where God walks and talks with man crystal clear. And when sin enters in, humans are they're taken out of God's presence. We're removed from that. And so the whole question of Scripture, it hinges on, is God ever coming back? Is that ever going to be restored. And so we see God's presence show up in different ways in the Old Testament. He's in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, he's in the Ark of the Covenant. There's always this barrier, there's always this thing in the way, because we're told that the sinfulness of humanity makes it impossible for them to experience God one-to-one. There's always a barrier. And so from Eden until this point, God is above us. But here, And Jesus, that God comes back to his people. He's no longer above us, now he's with us. And now this is unique to Jesus. Islam cannot claim this. They say, well, God is always above us. It's preposterous that you even entertain that God come down because we're dirty and disgusting and so on. He wouldn't be soiled by us. He'll send angels and prophets, but he himself will never go. Jesus turns that completely upside down. He goes, no, not only am I going to come, to my creation. I am excited. I am enthusiastic. He does it willingly. And so if you want to see God, look no further. Here he is in Jesus. We're told by Matthew right from the outset that God is with us once again. In verse 24, Matthew says, when Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So Joseph wakes up and goes to act. Notice, the humans in this story are so passive, they're sleeping. It's God's presence and God's grace that enable him to spring into action. Joseph isn't the starting point. The Lord is the starting point. But Joseph isn't passive forever. See, this is a really great picture of our faith, too, is that Joseph is visited by God and that inspires him and provokes him to action. Just in the same way as that when we experience God, we should also be inspired to and action, motivated to action. And then one little thing at the end here, there's one word in that sentence 
at the end that says quite a bit, and it's the word until. So there are some church traditions that believe that Mary remained a virgin for the rest of her life. And honestly, I'm not really sure why that is. There's nothing in Scripture that suggests that overtly. I think ultimately this stems from a really unhealthy view of sex, that they think that somehow something is lost by Mary being married to Joseph and experiencing everything that comes with marriage, that somehow it makes her unpure. But to think that it greatly misunderstands God's view of and purpose for sex and marriage. And the word until seems to really seal it there. I don't know how you can make this argument unless you're ready to argue the plain meaning of the word until. Sort of like that old Bill Clinton interview, like, well, it depends on what the word of definition of is is, right? Unless you're prepared to debate what the that the word until means what the word until always means, not, I, I don't see it. So what we have here is that Jesus, Matthew begins this gospel, the this, this story of Jesus, with spectacular news. That God is not distant any longer. He's not far away. He's not above us. He's with us. He comes to us. He initiates the action. And not only is he with us, he is for us. He comes to us. Why? To save us. Not from someone else, but from our sin. That is something to get excited about. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who is with us. That you are not above us. You are not off somewhere. You are not aloof. You are invested in us, your people. I pray that you would help inspire us to action as you have visited us, as you have come to us and saved us, that you would inspire us to act on your behalf. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.